I'm going to begin tonight with one of my own stories that I haven't told yet. We're also going to try and investigate the phenomenon I witnessed, which has been corroborated and seen by many other commercial and hobby divers. If you've been diving a lot or spend a lot of time around divers, you might have already guessed what I'm talking about. Black divers, one of the most persistent and unnerving legends that has plagued diving since the time of giant metal bell helmets. We'll dig into possible causes and explanations for this phenomena after I've written up my own encounter with them. This story comes from early in my time as a commercial diver on the Hibernia rig. The rig is the biggest in the world and is absolutely massive. Basically a small city jutting out of the sea floor. The entire thing is on top of a massive concrete platform settled on the bottom of the ocean that's also used to store barrels of crude. Even back when I was doing this, safety regulations were very important. Unlike most of my other jobs where I mostly inspect repair the integrity of the structures themselves, I was checking the oil storage itself to ensure it was safe, secure and not leaking out of containment. It was good work, steady work inspecting the site nearly every day and it paid well. Usually I worked with a group of two other divers. The day this happened was like pretty much any other. The weather was shit, the onboard chef's omelette was delicious and the rig workers were assholes. Nothing new began the dive, reached my target and began the inspection of lids, seams, ECT and taking water samples as well to ensure no minute particulate leakage. After a few minutes, I get a feeling on the back of my neck that I'm being watched. I turn around to see one of my partners floating a distance away from me, watching me work. I waved at him and gave the OK sign to signify that I am OK and he returned it. I wasn't sure why he was watching me instead of doing his own work, but I really didn't give much of a shit. I had a feeling in my gut though, that something wasn't right. I mulled it over in my mind while I worked. Something about him had seemed off, but I had no idea what it was. So I turned around again after a bit and sure enough he was still there, watching me. I waved to him and made the OK hand sign and again, he returned it. Something about the way he did it made me feel disgusted and repulsed. The fingers looked, wrong. If that makes any sense. I don't remember enough detail to describe exactly how they moved incorrectly, but I felt a distinct uncanny valley level repulsion upon seeing it. I was looking at something very, very wrong. My gut instinct was screaming at me that this guy was dangerous. That's when I realized what had actually been bugging me initially. The guy didn't have any bubbles coming out of his regulator. Oh shit, this guy has a regulator. My diving partner has a rebreather. This isn't my diving partner. Wait oh shit, how the fuck can this guy be giving off zero bubbles without a rebreather here's where I need to explain a bit of technical stuff for the non-initiated. Regulators are those typical scuba masks you see. You breathe in air from them, and exhale into the sea. Rebreathers are much bulkier and they recycle the air you're exhaling and reuse it so that you get more bang for your buck. Better for longer deeper dives than a regulator. Regulators make bubbles, rebreathers don't. Like I said, all our guys on the rig used rebreathers, it was company policy and it was just full stop the best option. This diver was using a regulator and on top of that he wasn't making any bubbles. Which is just screaming all kinds of wrong. I stare at him for a second as he just floats there, staring back at me through the gloomy water. My stupid search and rescue recovery instincts kick in and I assume this diver is having an emergency malfunction with his rebreather and cannot breath and is possibly already unconscious or dead. So I try to stuff down the blaring warning signs in my gut and swim over to him as quickly as I can. The warning signs in my gut get worse the closer I get, there's just something about this guy that is wrong, somehow. 
I can't describe it in any other way than that I knew instinctively that he should not exist. That he was wrong. My gut finally got the better of me just as I reached to pull off his broken regulator so we could share my rebreather on our way up. I stopped my hand a few inches away from the mask, and I felt an intense jolt of fear staring down into his mask. There was nothing behind his mask. It was completely empty. No eyes, no face, no skull, no corpse, nothing. Just empty blackness. I reached out with my hand and touched the top of his head. His wet suit hood squished inwards as I pushed, deforming the shape of his head. That's when it moved. The thing turned its mask up towards my face, raising its hand and making the OK sign again. My body was in full fight or flight mode at this point and though I'm no pussy, spooky phantom divers are pretty far past my limits of what I'm willing to fight. So I swam the fuck away, putting a decent distance between us before I dared to look back. When I turned to look I saw the diver floating backwards into the current, leaking black oil or blood or something from his mask, arms, and legs. It wasn't long before he was hidden entirely behind a black cloud, vanishing into the murky sea. I went back up to the surface as quickly as humanly possible, assuming that I had a bad mix of gas or a malfunctioning rebreather causing narcosis. The maintenance crews never found anything wrong with my gear, though that doesn't rule out the possibility of narcosis hallucinations. Man it sounds like you encountered some highly capable squid. I reached out with my hand and touched the top of his head. His wetsuit hood squished inwards as I pushed, deforming the shape of his head. When I turned to look I saw the diver floating backwards into the current, leaking black oil or blood or something from his mask, arms, and legs. It wasn't long before he was hidden entirely behind a black cloud, vanishing into the murky sea. Yee, it definitely is some kind of squid that is either friendly interested in humans enough to imitate something that doesn't signify danger, as opposed to what would happen if you saw a human-sized squid just staring at you. Some of them are not only insanely intelligent, but have literal active camouflage and can change their entire texture. So as promised, a bit of analysis insight into this particular phenomenon. There's a couple different names for them. Phantom divers, ghost divers, black divers. The stories aren't all the same. There's two basic types of phantom diver encounters. The ones with a body, and the ones without. Some people report seeing a corpse skeleton face behind the mask, others saw what I saw which is a seemingly empty black void with nothing inside except water. The common thread shared through most stories is the lack of bubbles, and the black blood mist emitted by the phantom diver. Not all stories have the black mist, but the majority do. There's a couple possibilities for this. It could be an actual supernatural phenomenon. Weird shit happens in the ocean. Divers die all the time. Could the ocean have some sort of property that traps the souls of those who die there, dooming them to float aimlessly on currents as ghostly phantoms I won't outright rule it out, because weird shit happens in the ocean. I've seen stuff that defies explanation time and time again. It could also be what I like to call a mind virus. You see it a lot amongst the DMT psychedelics community. The drugs are a window into your subconscious thought process. So if you go in with certain expectations or knowledge even if you don't realize you are, it will affect your experience. It's possible that people see phantom divers because they've heard stories about them, and it's something their subconscious mind jumps to when it experiences narcosis hallucinations. Which would mean that by spreading these stories, I am in fact contributing to the spread of this idea. The last possibility is very much related to the next story I have for you, I'll save it for after I have typed it up. Describe how the fingers were wrong. It happened quite a while ago and my memory is far from perfect, 
If I said that I remembered the exact detail of what made the fingers wrong, I'd be lying. There was something about the way they moved when he made the hand signal. It was like someone had studied exactly how a human hand functions without ever, having a hand or using it. And so there was just something missing in translation, an innate humanity in the gesture that was completely absent. This next story was written by the same old biologist who allegedly had a deep CROV he was operating eaten by the black carpet back in one of the first threads I posted on here. One of the biggest questions we face as a species is the question of sentience. What makes us sentient what allows us to exist, consciously? Self-aware. Why do we exist that's what fuels our search for other life, out there in the stars. But I would posit that we are searching in exactly the wrong direction. The effort, time, and resources to reach the stars are vast, and our chances of discovering any life, let alone intelligence, sapient, sentient life are astronomically small. That isn't to say that we shouldn't explore the stars only that we should finish exploring our own planet first. 80% of the Earth's oceans are unmapped, unseen, unexplored. Dark chasms of unknown depths never seen by human eyes, teeming with undiscovered species and wonders. What are the chances that some undiscovered form of intelligent life exists, somewhere in those unfathomable depths very, very likely. In fact, I am nearly certain that it does exist. I've seen the evidence with my own two eyes. It was another voyage, chasing after that profane and accursed siphonophore. The blasted thing has ruined my academic credibility and resisted my best efforts to record, observe, or prove its existence. I have not given up the search, but I grow more discouraged every year my prize eludes me. Even so, I saw something on this dive perhaps even more shocking, intriguing and abominable than that even the titanic black carpet of creeping flesh that lies at the deepest depths of the abyss. One of my remote hydrophones had picked up a sound unlike any I've ever heard in the ocean. I was entirely convinced that the colossal siphonophore himself was in the vicinity, and pushed ahead at flank speed towards the site, hoping to dive before the bastard could move on and vanish into the depths again. After agonizing hours spent staring at the horizon, willing my boat to crash faster through dark and unforgiving seas, I arrived at the location of my hydrophone. The dive took place mere minutes after my arrival, as I intended to waste as little time as possible and had gotten fully suited and prepared while my destination was yet an hour distant. As swiftly as I had arrived, still swifter I dove to the bottom, some 700 feet beneath the curling white caps and seething foam. My flashlight was the only illumination in the inky darkness, playing upon the innumerable tiny flotsam particles and microscopic plankton floating upwards on unseen current from still greater depths. As I dove, it became quickly apparent that several large barracudas shadowed my descent, each specimen measuring nearly eight feet in length. These inquisitive creatures are quite harmless to humans, despite what deceitful Luciferian hysteretic media sycophants might try to tell you. I felt no fear at witnessing these noble wolves of the sea, and instead welcomed their company. To my immense disappointment, two of the creatures vanished in pursuit of a large blue tuna, leaving me with only a singular companion as I plunged headfirst deeper into the abyss. Eventually, he too left me. I was alone with my thoughts for what seemed an eternity. Ever so slowly, the ocean floor came into view through the murky darkness. I beheld a great underwater plateau, perched at the edge of a steep plunge into even greater depths. A swift shadow shot out of the gloom at the plateau's edge in the corner of my vision, and I whirled to face the new danger. To my great relief and surprise, the silhouette belonged to none other than an exquisite bottlenose. The dolphin swam triumphant arcs round me, squeal chittering in his strange language in obvious delight to himself for having found a friendly light in such dark depths. Despite the affections and welcome from my new friend, 
I urgently pressed downward to the floor of the plateau with my companion in tow. I imagined at that moment that he must have been following out of sheer curiosity. What was this land ape doing alone at such a depth during the night, this land ape was on the hunt for big game. The biggest game ever to walk the ocean floor, perhaps. But I was not destined to find my old bane the colossal siphonophore today. Upon reaching the plateau floor I quickly noticed strange unnatural shapings shaping amongst the rock and coral. Sections worn and carved by water but seemingly with intent, purpose, and craftsmanship. Strange groove lines ran in circles on the stone seabed, each pattern similar and yet distinct. Astonished, I began to photograph and record as much of this incredible phenomenon as I could taking video and photos in great detail of the structures. After my manic enthusiasm had waned somewhat, I turned to look for my bottlenose companion. I found him sitting only a short distance away, staring at me with eyes that had suddenly lost their gleaming laughter. That was when it struck me like a bolt of thunder bottlenose dolphins never swim this deep. They definitely would never venture to the abyssal depth of the drop-off I had seen this one emerge from. As I had this very revelation, the flesh of the dolphin shifted and rippled in both shape, texture, and color. And I saw the thing's eyes burning with a cold and malevolent intelligence that I have never before and have never since witnessed even amongst the worst of mankind. The thing in front of me was no dolphin but rather a clever imposter from some yet unknown secretive species of mollusk. There was a moment where the both of us locked eyes, daring the other to make the first move. A tendril reached out from the mass and grasped my camera, slowly but firmly pulled it from my grasp. Apparently satisfied, the creature jetted away. Cloud of thick black ink leaving me to surface without a single speck of proof, evidence, or answers. I fully believe that the only reason I still breathe is that the creature knew my boat's discovery nearby with me missing would bring greater danger to him than I could by myself. All right, I'm back for a bit. I talked to the old biologist again, we're going to call him Murray to make my life a little bit easier. Now, Murray is a bit of a character. He talks and swears like an old sea captain despite being a marine biologist, and always seems to have a ready excuse for why he has no proof of the things he's apparently seen. I'm not particularly inclined to believe him most days out of the week, but I still find the stories fascinating. I asked him for a bit more in-depth explanation on the creature he saw, and his thoughts on it. His belief is that there is an unknown sentient species of cephalopod in the ocean. Cephalopods are squids, octopus, ECT in case you're wondering. Cephalopods are strange creatures, with a remarkable ability to mimic other forms of life. They also have a level of intelligence that has still to this day not been fully studied or documented. Octopus in the wild and captivity have been recorded to wave back at humans in an almost friendly manner. Supposing that an unknown, intelligent species of cephalopod existed if it did not want to be found, it would be extremely difficult or impossible to find it. Their ability to hide and mimic other forms of life is unmatched, especially if matched with a keen intellect. The creature described by Murray was able to create a near-perfect mimicry of a bottlenose dolphin. This is actually completely within the realm of reality. There is a species of octopus known as the Mimic Octopus that mimics a wide variety of creatures with stunning accuracy. This is achieved by a complete control of the shape, texture, and color of its body. It's possible that this unknown deep-sea mimic is also responsible for the black diver phenomena. A cephalopod of sufficient size could easily mimic human movement and mannerisms from the inside of a wetsuit. The black blood to me indicates that this might be the case. I wonder what these mimics might think of us humans. Invaders from the land. What secrets or mysteries might they hold could they have secret cities hidden in great unknown caverns at the bottom of the sea what purpose does imitating a human diver serve are they just observing us, 
or are their plans more sinister the entire idea frankly has me a bit on edge. These things could be hiding anywhere, disguised as anything. I might have swam past one a dozen times, been watched by them hundreds. Do they know me do they have a name for me if these things exist, I think it's better that they remain hidden and these questions remain unanswered. I tried to convince Murray of that, but he remains dead set on proving that they exist. There's one more question that's itching at the back of my mind. If it was a cephalopod mimic in that empty diving suit I saw, where the hell did it get the suit they must either scavenge the suits from dead divers, or actively murder divers to steal their suits and gear. I've heard enough stories about murderous octopus to not like where that is going one bit. So if you find yourself often beneath the waves of the ocean as I do be wary of any unknown divers, and objects that don't belong.